Not stop video. Was it stop video? And I'm recording and now I'm broadcasting. Welcome everyone. My name is Della Mosley. I use the pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm one of the co-founders of Academics for Black Survival and Wellness. Really happy that you're here with us today. Hello everyone. My name is Paris Bellamy. I am also one of the co-founders of Academics for Black Survival and Wellness. Uh, please excuse my appearance. I'm in the airport right now, but I cannot miss this conversation. And so I'm really excited and um, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Carlton Green. Thank you, Paris, and thank you, Della. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to day five. Um, I am so excited to be a part of this conversation, um, really with probably two of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, I just want to introduce you to them really quickly, and then I'm going to get out of the way, and they will be engaged in conversation. Um, you should also know, though, that before we get started, that you can send questions to the um, Q&A box. That's where we'll be handling those. Um, in addition to that, um, throughout this conversation, um, Annalise Singh might also pose some questions for the group. So feel free to respond to those questions as well um, so that we can give you some feedback on how those are um, uh, being responded to. So without further ado, I just want to introduce the two folks, the, the two women who are joining us. Um, Dr. Miriam Jernigan is currently a visiting professor of psychology at Agnes Scott College. She also maintains a private practice serving a, a diverse clientele with a range of clinical concerns. She is an expert in race, racial trauma, working with kids, adolescents, and families, um, qualitative research. She is just a brilliant, bright woman who I adore with all of my whole heart. Um, she is also the founder and executive director of Jernigan Associates LLC. Through her consultation company, she provides um, services on the national level to academic, healthcare, and private organizations, especially around issues related to either mental health or diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's Dr. Miriam Jernigan. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the um, other person who's joining us is Dr. Janity Helms. Dr. Helms is the Augusta Long Professor in the Department of Counseling, um, Developmental and Educational Psychology at Boston College where she's also the director of the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture. She's the past president of the Society of Counseling Psychology and she has a whole host of awards and um, uh, publications. I just really wanna highlight here though, that she is the author of Using Race and Culture in Counseling Psychology, Theory and, Theory and Process, which is a textbook that many of us use in our counseling training. And she's also the author of a, um, a book that is now sold out on Amazon.com, um, A Race as a Nice Thing to Have. Um, so without further ado, I want to thank both of them for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jernigan Noesi and Dr. Helms. Thank you, um, Dr. Green. It is uh, my pleasure, our pleasure to be here uh, today. Um, I am excited, I think, to join in conversation with one of my most favorite people, a person that I enjoy uh, conversing with, especially when talking about race um, and anti-racism in particular. Uh, and so for today, I think we will get started. Our, our goal as we were thinking about the conversation for today is really to um, certainly discuss white racial identity theory, um, which Dr. Helms has over the, for, for many, many years, decades even, you know, articulated and continues to apply to um, everyday life. Um, so to discuss white racial identity theory, to discuss the book that Dr. Uh, Green said is sold out a race is a nice thing to have. But we'd also like to focus on, uh, relative to thinking about college campuses and universities, um, teaching about racism if you are a white faculty member uh, and surviving the white faculty, staff, um, administrators and environments if you are um, a black indigenous or other person of color. So Dr. Helms, do you want to say something before we get started and I pull up just the beginning part of our slides that we prepared? Um, good afternoon. I will have to apologize because the earphones do not fit my ears. I think they were designed for ET or someone. So if I drop it occasionally, I hope that you will forgive me. Um, Dr. Jernigan and I hope to make this a conversation between the two of us. Uh, we've not done this one before, so we're both intrigued to see how it turns out. Uh, so shall we start? Absolutely. I'm just going to share um, my screen here. 
so that I can pull up our slides. <clears throat> So one of the things that we talked about in framing today's conversation was really starting with um, some ideas uh, about uh, an understanding of race and racism in particular, um, and then you know moving that conversation to think about how race and racism, anti-racist work can really play out in the college and university setting. But we thought it would be important just to start with. Um, the different types of racism, I think a definition of racism to kind of get us all on the same page. So Dr. Helms, I think you were going to start us off by, you know, kind of defining and then we were going to talk together, talk through um, some of the definitions of racism in particular. Well, I probably to start by explaining why I think it's important to talk about racism when I am talking about white racial identity. And my theory of white racial identity is essentially built on the premise that white people, instead of focusing so much on groups of color when they think about racism, need to begin to think about how racism is inherent in the condition of being white in uh, US society. Um, and so my theory actually talks about how one recognizes the racism in one's context and then how one overcomes it or as someone suggested, how some recovers from racism. So when we think about racism, it's not actually clear what people are talking about. And I think that is because there's a, a confusion in how we conceptualize racism. Uh, the popular words now are systemic racism but I don't think people really know what that means. And often when they're talking about systemic racism, then they're really talking about some other kind of racism. So um, I wanna uh, uh, maybe give the definitions and maybe uh, Dr. J will help figure out uh, how they might pertain to some of the situations that exist in society now or in the academic climate as she's familiar with. So institutional racism, and I should pause and say that these come from uh, James Jones's actually doctoral dissertation. I am always surprised that he never gets any recognition or citation because he's the one who actually broke racism down into his various categories. So when people talk about uh, racism, they are systemic racism. They're talking about what Jones would call institutional racism. And so those are laws and policies that are designed to favor white people over all other people. They especially are designed to favor white men because white men are the people who are seen to be entitled to privilege in our society. So laws and policies, Dr. Jernigan, any ideas? Yeah, so we were having, I think, a, 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 just a general conversation um, previously, and certainly in preparation for today's conversation. I think a wonderful illustration for me, as you see there in the, in the parentheses as an example, is just the current situation um, that we're dealing with with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I say that because, um, as you so wonderfully articulated, there is a way in which the idea of systemic racism um, continues to, as I see it, be more present um, in both sort of writing and media and usage in ways that it has not previously. And so as we think about the use of the term, you know, systemic racism, I feel like there's been a disconnect um, between those who proclaim to understand systemic racism and institutional racism and, um, and really thinking about you know, being committed to anti-racism and those that truly understand the reality of what that commitment looks like. Um, so there are many ways I think that we can talk about, you know, COVID-19 and many factors that kind of look at the lack of response. But one of the things that's been striking to me as a Black person, as an academic, as a scholar, as a clinician, um, is, you know, the fact that um, prior to, right, the recent conversation or discourse nationally with regard to, you know, our most recent wave of um, anti-Black uh, violence by way of killing, um, COVID-19 was upon us. And so after the killing of George Floyd, um, there were several folks that I talked to, yourself included, that talked about the fact that we started spontaneously, right, receiving phone calls from some of our white colleagues, in some cases, white folks that we didn't know very well at all. Um, but 
one of the questions that I found amongst black and brown people in particular was this idea of, so we'll start here kind of thinking about um, where were those phone calls when COVID-19, you know, started? And in particular, uh, understanding that as racial, you know, information about racial disparities, although imperfect and incomplete, right, with regard to the folks who were being most greatly impacted by infection, by hospitalization, by mortality, um, as well as by morbid morbidity, right, were Black and Brown and Indigenous folks. And so if you understand all of then, right, the continued conversation around what that may mean, you know, systemically, why that might be the case, really looking at the health disparities and the outcomes, I would have hoped um, that there would have been, right, an actualized understanding and discourse there. Um, but this, you know, now that we're, you know, in the conversation, certainly that may be the case, but looking systemically, I think that it's been noteworthy um, that as that data also emerged, we've the, what you and I talked about, and we could maybe speak a little bit more to this, the pivot with regard to what seemed like the urgency to address the issue systemically, right? So as we see states, even colleges and universities begin to talk about reopening a systemic understanding, right, with regard to policies would allow us to ask questions, um, to challenge and to really think about relative to this pandemic, which is, you know, affecting everyone globally, what are the other considerations that need to be taken, you know, um, into place as we think about, you know, the individuals that are being affected within the institutions and the disparities that likely occur. Um, so, you know, as I sit as a black faculty in meetings and on task force and think about COVID-19 in preparation, it, you know, I'm listening to folks who tout diversity and racial, you know, racial diversity. Um, and who, you know, are the ones upholding uh, the institutional diversity by way of the uh, admissions brochures, but at the same time, there's just this lack of acknowledgement, a lack of understanding, and a lack of reality with regard to, you know, the policies and the institutional um, considerations that we should really be thinking about as we talk about uh, what this will mean for students, for myself as a faculty member, for other um, uh, people of color administrators as well. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Helms? I, I do. I think that um, institutional racism is difficult to overcome because it can be invisible. So if we take the example of COVID-19, that's visible. But before there was COVID-19, there were health disparities among all of the groups that Dr. Jernigan mentioned. No one was particularly concerned about that. And so unless... Um, something becomes so visible that it threatens the institution, then there's no, there's no change. And so what I hope to do is to encourage people to begin to think about how they can change before there's a major crisis, how they can recognize the institution and how it works before there's a major crisis. And it shouldn't only be uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who recognize it. I want white people to be able to recognize it because after all, it was white people who created it. Okay, so let, let's see if we can move on to the next type. Um, interpersonal. That's a person to person, group to group, community to community. And it's the situation in which negative racial stereotypes are applied to um, I use the words Alana, so African American, Latino, uh, Asian American, and Native American uh, people. Applying negative racial stereotypes to people of color and white people and engaging with them as if the stereotypes are true. And it, some people think that if they don't use the N word or whatever the equivalent is for other groups of color, then they aren't really using racial stereotypes. But in fact, they, in fact, they are. Uh, when I was doc talking with Dr. Jernigan, you, had, you, you came up with a couple that are particularly prevalent uh, in your context uh, in the university and maybe in society more generally. Sure. I mean, historically, um, you know, the notion of invisibility um, for um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color is one that's been, you know, talked about, written about. Um, but what's striking about, you know, being in, you know, invisibility and how it, you know, plays out from an interpersonal perspective is that on the one hand, there's this lack of regard or, you know, just disregard for um, the individual, right? Yet at the same time, you're visible in other ways. So I, the example that I often use is when I've entered into institutions um, as one of few people of color, as certainly one of few black women, 
it's always striking to me how many individuals know my name um, before introduction, yet at the same time, on a day-to-day -day basis, no one speaks to me, right? So there's a lack of an acknowledgement of my presence. I'm not represented um, in many ways within you know, the, the institution, and certainly that plays out um, amongst myself and my colleagues uh, within the institution. And so just really thinking about the interpersonal ways in which uh, racism shows up, there's really this continuum that we've talked about. So that's, you know, on one hand, uh, end of the continuum, thinking about invisibility. And then at the other end of the continuum, you know, looking at the incident of George Floyd, um, you know, which, you know, for many folks, the ultimate, you know, one of the ultimate kind of manifestations of racism in terms of, you know, as a result of interpersonal violence, right, being targeting, resulting um, in his, death. Um, so, and, and again, you know, thinking about those things that happen in between, right, that notion of what's playing out, you know, for me, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, and then this example that um, has caused so many folks, at least more recently, to react. So, almost the difference between omission and commission. Mm -hmm. uh, if people don't see you, then uh, they can't, you can't say that they're really committing anything but they are committing something, but it's easy for them to deny that they are. Yeah. Uh, moving on, intrapersonal. Um, white Western uh, culture emphasizes individualism. And so intrapersonal has to do with the individual's internalized racial beliefs. Uh, many people believe that they don't have internalized racial beliefs. And that's because there's a tendency among white people to focus on other people. Uh, actually, when I wrote the book on white racial identity, one of the critiques was that white people don't really have any internal beliefs, so this can't be true. But in fact, uh, individuals do have racial beliefs. Often those beliefs are based on stereotypes or uh, social roles that people are expected to engage in as members of groups of color uh, in the society. Um, I, I think, I think this one was yours as well, Dr. Jernigan. I think, um, yes, if using some of the, the more national examples and then bringing it, you know, a little uh, closer to home. Um, I think nationally, if we look at, again, the more recent events, if you think about, as we were discussing the cases of Ahmaud Arbery and even Breonna Taylor and um, Rayshard Brooks uh, in Atlanta, Georgia here, um, the idea, you know, as we continue to await or to look for or to um, seek um, some consequence uh, for the deaths of those individuals, the idea that, that the uh, white individuals who have been involved, there's this right to be perceived as innocent, even when guilty, that plays out in the media, right? Um, so, and, and I deliberately left out George Floyd because these were the cases that we discussed, but in particular, and, and because of the Ahmaud Arbery incident, um, happened in February, so long, long. I put that in air quotes. You know, before the the George Floyd incident, which seemed to at least um, spur folks forward with regard to thinking about anti-racism work. Um, but so we have a video uh, in the case of Ahmaud Arbery as well. What was interesting is the narrative that began to you know be generated, right? So the idea of the white men who were involved, right? That 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 there was some way in which people needed to understand, right? The killing. Um, that occurred and that people could witness um, if they chose to watch the video or read about um, in this particular incident. And even in the case of Breonna Taylor, um, I was reading an article this morning just talking about the fact that we are, you know, um, a while afterwards and there's been some legislation or policy, but again, this idea that, you know, there had to have been a reason or this innocence, even in the face of sometimes really blatant evidence to the contrary or that would lead to the contrary. As, as one example that we talked about, you know, on a national level. And then I think Dr. Hounds, if you, certainly I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. But also you had another example that for me was really poignant with regard to this idea of internalized racial beliefs. So just the consequence of, for example, what happens um, when a white person may feel guilty about a racial incident and how that shows up intrapersonally, what that means. I, I think it, it may be gender specific, for example, it's not too unusual when race, race, racism talks begin for white women to get distressed. It's, it's not clear to me that they are distressed about the racial incidents. It seems more like they're distressed about how they feel about being in the situation where these things are being discussed. And so they will cry. In our society, we're socialized to protect white women 
And so when they cry, everyone turns their attention to the white woman who, is, who has been hurt by the situation from her perspective, and then conversation stops. Or the, gen, the, uh, the gender role for uh, white men is if they are stressed by talking about racial issues, then they either get angry and often storm out of the situation, or they begin to denigrate the people who bring the message that they don't want to hear. They're allowed to do that because they have white male privilege in the society and they're supposed to control situations in ways that make sense to them. So a part then of uh, overcoming institutional racism, which is what this is about, is recognizing the ways in which it's layered. So one has to deal with the interpersonal, one has to do, deal with the intrapersonal, and then one also has to deal with the institutional. So always be aware that those levels exist and each one needs its own kind of attention. There's a question in the, in the, that's come up that could be easily clarified. They want to know, do you think that there's a difference between institutionalized racism and systemic racism, or are those interchangeable? I, I think they're inter interchangeable. I so, think, I think, I'm sorry. I'm, did, did you want to go? You can, you can talk. I, would I, can't, I, I, can't see, I can't see you, so I can't see what uh, you want to I would, I would just say I would agree with you, Dr. Helms. You, you know, systemic sounds, sounds better than institutional because systemic sounds like it just sort of happens, whereas institutional says it's happening in our institutions. And so therefore we have to remove it from the institutions. Where do you remove it if it's systemic? Yes, and I think that, that you and I were also talking about the fact that um, one of the challenges for some folks with regard to anti-racism work or even language that we've used previously to describe it is the tendency to move away from or avoid language. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. I couldn't hear you before. I was saying we were talking about the fact that um, one of the challenges with regard to, for some folks, anti-racism work is the, the, the tendency to use language that really promotes this distancing um, from, you know, the idea of culpability or responsibility. So to your point, right, the idea of systemic racism may feel in terms of its you know, usage currently may um, feel better for folks, but I think that the consequences as you indicated, which is that it also allows for folks to not really have a strategy um, or a way of talking about how to deal with systemic racism versus as you indicated, in institutional racism says, okay, it's here, we need to own it, take some responsibility. So that's, it's noteworthy for me, um, the language that we use. And I think we need to be intentional and thoughtful about the language that we're using, even if, even when we see, you know, language being used interchangeably. Okay, we, we agree. Yes, we do. Uh, so, so are we about to talk about white racial identity now? Yes, I mean, I think um, a couple of things to point out as we transition into the conversation on right racial identity and our topic today. Um, there was a video that was released this morning um, uh, featuring Dr. Green as well as another one of your former advisees um, and academic sons, Dr. Kevin Henze, who provided, I think, a more in-depth overview of the white racial identity theory. So if folks have not had an opportunity to watch that video, I certainly encourage you to go um, back to the video. I also will, this is my copy, if we can see it through my virtual screen, it might be okay. Um, I also encourage folks to, um, if you haven't uh, located, a race is a nice thing to have. For me, it was one of the most important um, readings uh, that have allowed me in my academic career and in life, quite frankly, um, provided me with a blueprint um, by which to really understand whiteness and to understand whiteness from an institutional perspective so that I could have a blueprint or a strategy for navigating and surviving um, whiteness. And so as we, you know, go or transition or shift gears into thinking about white racial identity, I'm wondering, Dr. Helms, if you, in addition to the video earlier, right, and the book, um, might provide us with a brief overview of the theory as well as um, locate us with regard to uh, of the schemas that you articulate, you know, what 
which ones um, might be really significant as we think about you know race racism and also anti-racist work um, yes I can do that uh, this will be a very very brief uh, summary of the racial identity theory because as you mentioned I talk about it a lot in the book there there's a chapter for each of these schemas that I'll talk about and I haven't seen Carlton's uh, video, but I'm sure it's probably excellent because they usually are. So um, I talk about white racial identity in terms of schemas and schemas might not make much sense to you. So one way to think about schemas are uh, that they are the lenses through which we interpret racial events. Um, so just as we could have several different kinds of lenses, we might have, for example, have sunglasses and reading glasses and so forth. We could have different kinds of schemas for recognizing the, uh, how we relate to race and racism in our, in our environments. So I propose uh, six for uh, white racial identity development. Uh, three of them, the contact, disintegration, and re reintegration, or what I call the internalized racism schemas. They are what you were born learning is true about whiteness, essentially. They're the schemas that allow you the privilege of, of, being, of being white, of knowing the rules of whiteness, of being white. One can overcome uh, racial racism socialization. And I propose three schemas through which that might happen as well pseudo-independence, immersion, immersion, and autonomy. So I want to maybe take a quick look at what uh, each of these looks like. Uh, the internalized racism ones, for example, are schemas in which people are very uh, uncomfortable talking about race and racial issues and racism. Uh, contact is the schema where you're totally oblivious to the social political implications of race. So in um, today's society, there are people who, white people who can say, I didn't know we had any racial problems. And in fact, if you look at the surveys that were happening before this recent uh, uprising, uh, white people thought that everything was fine with respect to white race, to, with respect to in the society, so then around them. In classrooms, educators and researchers will often say, I don't see race, so I don't see any reason to talk about it. Uh, it has no meaning to them. Sometimes as a result of um, being able to use the contact schema, the person comes in contact with situations that are uh, disorienting. For example, the recent George Floyd incident was disorienting for some white people because it for forced them to recognize the moral dilemma of how people are treated differently by the police in this instance because of their, of their uh, racial group membership. So disintegration is the confusion, the anxiety, the fear, the guilt that occurs when people recognize that although everyone is supposed to be treated equally, they are not. The way to educators often handle this is they say, well, talking about racism in my area of expertise, maybe we could invite a person of color in to talk about it uh, because I don't want to miseducate you. They're showing that they are not willing to learn about this issue in the same way that they would learn about other kinds of issues that they wanted to talk about with their classes. Uh, disintegration is uncomfortable. And so people may uh, drop back, resort to using their contact lenses or they may develop the reintegration lenses. Contact and reintegration are strong themes in our, in our environment. Reintegration uh, indicates the person believes that they deserve the superior treatment that they receive. And so they act in ways, not even always consciously, in ways that maintain that deserved, quote unquote, superiority. So educators talking to black, indigenous, and other people of color, students who talk about race or injustice, if they're using their reintegration schema, they find ways to blame the person for using those skills rather than uh, they find, <laughs> my telephone is ringing. They find ways to blame the person for uh, their um, talking about injustice 
So they will say, it's not really injustice. You're just not qualified for where you are. So they will, rather than thinking about whether in fact injustice exists. So reintegration theorists are, pro are protectors of racism. Um, I don't know, actually, I don't know why, but sometimes it's necessary for reintegration people to be able to exist in a multiracial uh, society. And some of them begin to take steps to uh, develop uh, a more, uh, for them, accepting view of, of racial issues in the society. And this begins with um, pseudo-independence, which you might think about as, um, as a white liberalism. It's an intellectualized acknowledgement of racism and a desire for it to go away. So often the people who use pseudo-independence are the people who say, I'm going to be your ally. So they recognize that racism exists, but they don't want to, they can't take responsibility for racism existing. So it's not that they're fighting for our common cause when they address issues of racism, it's that they're fighting for your cause when they address issues of racism. Uh, to be frank, um, the people of color usually like pseudo-independent people a lot better than they like some of the other schemas that I've outlined, because at least they're trying to do something positive with respect to race, even though that positive thing may sometimes feel oppressive to those of, those of us who were quote unquote benefiting from it. Um, as pseudo-independent people begin to recognize uh, racism and began to be accepted actually by people of color, uh, interestingly, they also began to wonder why there is no white uh, affiliation similar to the affiliation that people of color often enjoy. Um, that's usually funny to me because it will show up as uh, white people saying, well, there's no white engineering course or no white engineering club, uh, but there's a black engineering club. And so then I always have to point out that everything in U.S. society is a white club. And so to overcome racism, we have to recognize how white clubs oper operate. Um, there is a lot of pseudo-independence in uh, academic environments. In fact, um, people now talk about themselves as being woke. People who are talk about themselves as being woke are usually using the pseudo-independence uh, schema. Um, and so it's okay if they want to think they're woke, but they still have some awakening to do. Immersion, immersion is the schema where people, white people began to accept the personal responsibility to end racism. They began to recognize that they are enjoying and benefiting from racism and that it's important for them to take action to overcome the uh, benefits of racism. Uh, immersion, immersion is where people began to break the white racial socialization rules in order to make the environment more consistent with who they probably are uh, in their inner core. I, I like to think that in their inner core, all people are fair, but the socialization process may have encouraged them to develop uh, racism as their way of coping. So an educator who can use the immersion schema uh, might say in the classroom, I'm going to talk about racism or injustice, even if I don't do it correctly. It's rather than saying, I'm not going to talk about it because I don't know the way to do it. The person takes responsibility for learning how to do it. If it doesn't work one way, then they take it from another direction just so that they can have the uh, opportunity to begin to make changes with respect to racism in the environment. Um, I should probably say here that uh, people who use the immersion, immersion schema are likely to be rejected by other white people because they're breaking the socialization rules. Um, and so it's going to be important for them to not retreat. It's going to be important for them not to expect people of color to solve this dilemma, but rather they need to begin to find other white people that they can educate to be or to use their immersion immersion schema. The last one, autonomy, is the process of developing a humanistic way of being. So recognizing that in fact, people are people. Uh, there are all sorts of different people and who we are doesn't depend on our skin color. Who we are depends on how God made us if you believe in God or how we were born if you don't believe in God. The educator says, 
who can use this schema says, let's consider how racism influences our, our situation. So it's not just your problem, it's our problem. And ultimately, that's where I would like people to uh, begin to function most of the time, because I think that's how we begin to address the issues of uh, racism in its various forms that we've talked about. So, um, Dr. Jernigan, that's my, my brief summary. Does that do it? That does do it. <laughs> so, then, so then I have a question for you. Okay. Um, often when I present this, people say, well, there are lots of different intersections people have. So why don't we just talk about diversity rather than talking about white racial identity? What do you think? Would it work if I just change this to uh, a, a model of diversity? Absolutely not. I mean, in short, um, and, and my, you know, there's the, my thinking on that, you know, as someone, again, who as a graduate student, and, you know, as I transition into my own career and have watched just language change, um, diversity as a term we know is a very broad umbrella term. It's rarely been my experience since, you know, starting work, I would say as a consultant for institutions of higher education, which I was encouraged by you to do <laughs> way back when. Um, and you, you know, presented some of those initial opportunities. What's, what's been consistent for me, and I think in our conversations, is that the use of the term, you know, diversity, um, for some folks it's still uncomfortable, but for many more, it kind of goes back to the earlier conversation we were having. It's, it's comfortable, it's palpable, right, for people. Um, but it doesn't provide, right, a, a, an in-depth look at the actual issue. So it's often the case when, you know, if we get phone calls, um, you know, with regard to diversity trainings, et cetera, and then you begin to gather information, it's more often the case, in my experience, that there's an issue as it pertains to, you know, race, um, or in some cases, you know, race, uh, some, some other aspect, you know, under the diversity umbrella, but more often than not, um, the terminology is used as a way of watering down the issue or really not, right, um, highlighting what's actually going on, and folks are really hesitant to name, um, to own, and to really, you know, speak uh, life into, you know, what really needs the attention or focus within an institution. So, especially when we're having conversations about anti-racism, I think encouraging people to get really comfortable um, naming what the issue is. I think there are many of us that would be happy, right, to really talk about the nuance, you know, with regard to thinking about intersectionality. Again, I have yet to have the experience where I can get there. Um, you know, for, because there's not even a basic understanding or willingness, quite frankly, to look at the issues which are very present and prominent and often, um, in my experience within institutions, um, are conversations around race and racism. Okay, so I can, I can, I can still say I'm talking about white people. Yes. Yeah, and, and ideally, um, folks will sit with that, we'll be all right now. So I'm going to actually stop Sharing. Actually, before I stop sharing my screen, I, I found this slide um, that you sent me, Dr. Helms, and I just think it's really powerful because as we're having this conversation about academic um, or within the context of academia, this is data that you pulled, um, you know, from some statistics in 2016. I want folks to look at this for context um, as we talk about, right, what it means to approach um, anti-racist work within colleges and universities. Um, so just looking at some, again, data I'm sure not as perfect, but still significant with regard to uh, for from a faculty perspective, right, who may be uh, represented within an institution um, higher, of a higher education, but also as we look at um, what happens there with regard to uh, racial categorization. Uh, but I will stop sharing my screen as folks take that in so that we can- But, but before you go entirely, uh, I would just say, take note of where the power structure lies in the institutions. Yeah. Uh, and so that means, in effect, the power structure, the policy, the racist policy, if you will, essentially lies with the white men and white women in the institution. And so one needs to be aware of that as one uh, begins to tackle these issues of institutional racism. Because I have a theory that um, when you talk about racism with white people, the white person always perceives that they have something to lose. And so you have to be, enter the negotiations with the sense of what it is that they might be protecting. Oh. Okay. Okay. 
Right. Um, so I would say yes. So if we can um, move into for the last kind of segment of the you know of the hour, we talked about really honing in on um, institutions, um, so colleges and universities, and going back to our definitions of racism. I know that we offered some examples, um, but really looking at what are the current conversations around race and racism and in institutions that are happening now, um, as well as those that you know may continue through summer into the fall and long beyond um, is the idea. So if, for example, we look at an institutional level, at an interpersonal level, at an intrapersonal level, and really try to explore how right, white racial identity in particular is showing up, um, one of the, the you know, things for me that's been really noteworthy is more recently um, the practice of institutions as I've seen, right, as, as institutions release statements of asking, uh, we were talking about students and faculty and staff um, of color to um, relive racially traumatic situations or events with the alleged goal of developing um, new policies, new procedures or institutional um, uh, guidelines is the idea. Um, yes, um, actually, I think most in, most in institutions probably operate from a contact perspective, uh, and so they don't really have a plan for figuring out how to deal with racism until the racism happens. Um, and what that means in uh, contact, and then there's us usually a small group of pseudo-independent people who think they understand the issues, but they don't understand the issues because they can't really address them from a white perspective. They can only address them from a people of color perspective, which they can't really do because they are not people of color. So um, often on a university campus, then you find that um, students are often aware of issues of race and racism on the campus all the time. But uh, the institution, the administrators are usually not aware of it until something happens like, uh, someone sends a negative message over uh, one of the social media or someone hangs a noose in a dormitory and then they become aware of it. But what they don't aware, become aware of is what's happening in the environment. And because we are in a time now where the environment is essentially focused on people of colors, trauma, the institutions are using it without recognizing the extent to which they are re-traumatizing people of color. Uh, so, uh, for example, I talk, you, you started out mentioning, Miriam, about how institutions are used for people of color. Mm -hmm. I've, I've looked at some of the efforts that universities are making, at least in their letters, to students to address issues of racism. And just about all of them start with, we want people of color to come out and tell us what the issues are so that we can make policy without recognizing that reliving these incidents is happening for them every day. You can't, for instance, go on, on your TV without seeing examples of the traumatized people of color. So now for purposes of improving the institution, the administration wants the students to relive these incidents. Well, we can't continue to ask people of color to be the people who suffer in order to end racism. We could ask it if they were the people who created it, but they didn't. And so we need to have then white people begin to think more about who they are and what they want the institution to be like with respect to issues of race and racism. Okay. We have a question here that I want to ask really quickly. Um, it says, uh, th and it, it speaks to the theory directly. Um, if, how do you begin to explain to people who already see themselves as autonomous operating at a humanist level, they think all lives matter, about the importance of going through this entire development, um, racial identity development, about addressing racism specifically. I'm thinking here especially about those coming from a religious framework who use this religious framework to not interrogate racism at all. Well, I, I, I have two answers to that question. <laughs> One answer is that when I do consulting workshops, and someone stands up and says, I, I use the, I'm in autonomy. I use that schema all the time. I know that they're not in autonomy. It means that they don't understand the process. 
uh, racism is always changing. And what that means is that we as individuals need to always be changing to cope with it because we can't kill it. We can't destroy it until we recognize the way that it's showing up in our, in our context. Um, religion is an institution and most of the re religious organizations have men as the people who are head of these institutions. And so in many ways, they reenact what happens in society. So one also then has to be able to question that context. You can't, you can't, well, you can, but perhaps you shouldn't believe everything that's said to you in a religious context or by a religious person simply because it's religion. Uh, religion is meant to change and grow as well. I, um, Dr. Helms, as you were talking about the um, response by um, colleges, universities, institutions, um, also wanted to highlight um, with regard to some of the expectation that uh, people of color will, will relive traumatic situations. We were also having a discussion about um, just the nuance with regard to and I'm also bringing in, you know, the reactions of the, the consequence of response for, for um, people of color. But the idea or some of the commentary is that when folks are attempting to say something empathic, right, when engaging with a colleague of color, that the response is always, you must be feeling a particular way, right? So the person of color is feeling a particular way. Um, and something that you highlighted, um, I think in our discussion that's really important um, and, I, and is absolutely true is that, well, if we're all taking ownership, so really operating from that autonomous um, schema, the idea is that it's a, you know, an, an us problem. And so in some of the, you know, retorts or re responses um, that we've had with folks and asking them, well, how are they feeling about what's going on? Why is it, you know, sort of assumed that only I, right, should be and, and, and I am the only one having the response. What's your response? Um, how are you feeling about that sometimes met with confusion? And I think that's um, pretty, pretty significant uh, because it certainly illustrates that that person is not operating, you know, from the ideal, you know, ever evolving autonomous schema, uh, but certainly really, I hopefully forces folks to kind of shift and really take some ownership and understand racism as an us issue and an us problem. One of my ongoing dilemmas, which I uh, try to address as much as I can, is that white people have trouble communicating what it means to be a white person. And so I, I never understand, for instance, how you could watch someone dying in the street who's a person of color and not have personal feelings yourself as opposed to feelings for other people. Um, I watch white people in distress and I have personal feelings. So I'm wondering what the process is that white people use to protect themselves from having feelings and recognizing the situation as a, a situation, a situation that could potentially happen to them. So it's a, it's, I think it's a separation that um, white people hopefully will begin to reflect on and think about how they might change it. From an interpersonal perspective within, you know, colleges um, and universities, um, both as a student, I think, and as an academic, um, some additional, I think, is examples that are, are pretty impo important and poignant are, you know, just recognizing the total reality um, of your BIPOC colleagues, um, for example. And again, given those demographics that you presented, you know, found and presented for us on the slide, uh, the reality is that for um, people of, uh, of color on a college or university campus, um, they are going to be a numer uh, numerical um, minority in that sense. And so when welcoming in new faculty, for example, or even students, you know, this idea of ignoring reality shows up in these interesting interpersonal ways. For example, and I can attest to this, being invited um, for social events or to social events as a new faculty member to get to know everyone um, when I've transitioned to a new state in areas of a particular city, right, that have a historical racial hostility towards Black people or other people of color. Um, so just that, you know, disregard, you know, I can recall even being a graduate student in the Northeast and folks setting up social events in parts of the area that I was in that in no way, shape, or form, you know, given my knowledge of the history, would I attend? And that being couched at or at least perceived as being antisocial versus 
no one taking the time to take into consideration when you're you know, creating social events um, or inviting folks into certain parts um, of a particular geographic area or otherwise, like really think about um, really the realities of everyone there as opposed to what's you know, familiar to you or what's immediately you know, accessible with regard to your own experience or lens. I, I think that's a good example. Um, many of my white colleagues think that I'm antisocial because they will invite me to events in hostile territory. I am not going to those events in hostile territory. And so I now wonder, why don't they think about that? Why are they not aware that they are asking me to go into dangerous neighborhoods? They can mm -hmm. easily tell me why they've avoided going into dangerous Black or Latinx neighborhoods, but they don't see the parallel situation for me. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a matter of not only cultural empathy, but it's a matter of being able to see yourself as the other person, essentially. Right. Um, and because I'm looking at the poll, we have a number of students that are with us as well. I can speak again to my own historical experience as a student, but also as a faculty member who has many students of color that find me uh, um, on campus. And I can certainly understand understand why, but also just thinking about in the classroom for our many faculty that are also present. I, I've seen some attempts, colleges and universities for folks to you know, decolonize their syllabi and things of that nature, but really thinking about what are the examples that you're using when you are teaching? What are the images um, that you're using when you're teaching students so that an idea of representation and how that does or does not show up? Um, I'm very aware when I walk into a building and all of the walls are adorned with you know, pictures of white men. Um, and that sends a message to me, always has, right, across my entire um, academic trajectory, certainly as a faculty member at a new institution, but also for my students as well. And so um, I'm very uh, aware of the many ways, as I said, I would love to get there, the many ways in which, you know, we think about intersexual identity and how that shows up in my teaching, in the books that I offer, um, in the videos that I choose, in the content that I reference. But I certainly have had experiences, as you and I were talking, uh, Dr. Helms, where, you know, someone uses a general, what they think is a general cultural reference, and I have no idea um, what they're talking about. The example that I gave you, which, you know, was from a long time ago, is talking um, in, a, I think, peer-to-peer -peer situation, and someone mentioned The Wizard of Oz, and I was like, I've never seen The Wizard of Oz. I've seen The Wiz, but I've never, you know, The Wizard of Oz is not something that I, uh, it, it was shock and awe, but at the same time, I was like, why is that shock and awe? First of all, have you seen The Wiz and why not? Um, but also just the, the assumption that I should, right? Well, but what do you mean? Because this is just a general, you know, American and not even recognizing, you know, locating that in the United States of America um, because there's more than, you know, uh, that's another, I digress. <laughs> that's another situation. So language is powerful as well. But at the same time, you know, just again, that lens and that scheme and the assumption that based on one's own lens or, or what gets, you know, perpetuated with regard to, you know, curriculum and teaching is something that everyone should know. And I think I was in that moment, at least able to as a student challenge and just sort of say, but that's not my reality. A, there's nothing wrong with that. So I didn't appreciate the sentiment or the response to that um, in the classroom setting. But also, you know, what you have never questioned yourself as to why you've not seen the Wiz in this particular example. And, and why, why is that? There are, there, there are a lot of questions here. Um, we have probably about 500 people who are on the Zoom call um, and there could be more on Facebook. One of the questions that's come up that also kind of gets back into this interpersonal violence piece, somebody is looking for some um, uh, suggestions. What do white people who are very sensitive do when they are overwhelmed with sadness about what's happening to black people and the white people can't help crying? Should they leave the room to get a sense of equilibrium before returning to the room? so that the conversation isn't misdirected to the white person crying? So I'm assuming Dr. Green that this is in a cross racial or in air quotes, you know, kind of dialogue, yeah. My, my, my answer would be no. Um, I am not a parent, but I know that babies learn to self-soothe. Mm. And so if they find themselves crying and overwhelmed, they should self-soothe themselves rather than becoming the center of attention. And that self-soothing, uh, actually, I say to my clients, crying never stopped anyone from talking. So if you have something to say, then talk through those tears. If you can't talk through the tears, soothe yourself and then come back and talk, and talk through those tears. If you leave the room, that means that attention shifts to you and everyone starts worrying about whether you're okay and then the topic, the climate in the room has changed 
because it's our condition to believe that we shouldn't hurt people. I would add to that, Dr. Helms, for the, you know, for the uh, folks of color, um, allow people to self-soothe. Don't feel the need to, you know, to shift attention or to rescue, um, because I do think there's a way in which we can be socialized to do that, right? Because it's part of the environment um, to go along with or to acquiesce uh, to what else is happening in the room. And then unfortunately to ruminate about, ruminate about it, you know, after the fact. Um, so I think we all, um, could, could learn a lesson in just sort of sitting and allowing, right, for the emotion for the person to be able to self-soothe while proceeding with, you know, the importance uh, of, of the topic of the discourse that's happening. Did you have another question for us? Yeah, so this is one of the very first questions that came in, Dr. Helms and, and Dr. Jordan again. It says that Dr. Helms mentioned the possibility of recovering from racism. I would be very interested to hear how she conceptualizes this stage of recovery, the criteria for the stage, and whether or not, whether this is in fact possible, what would this actually look like? I'm thinking about this on the level of the individual. Pseudo-independence, immersion, and autonomy, <laughs> which, which uh, we covered and they're covered more extensively in my book. Yeah. Yeah, I was holding that up. I was with my virtual background having trouble, but I would say, and it's short, um, not that even if it was long, I would say read it. Um, but I think it's very accessible and I am not. I mean, it, certainly I'm biased um, in, in terms of my love and appreciation for Dr. Helms. But at the same time, I'm, I'd like to think my mother taught me not to fit. It has been a very powerful experience to really understand um, not just theoretically and conceptually in the way that academics like to do, but also um, it's applicable to real life experiences, but, but allows you to really understand some of the language and the idea of what that looks like for the white people in your life or if you're white identified. The, the other thing I would say about that is that it's a self-help book. So mm -hmm. how you are white, you have to define that. It's not something that I can actually define from the outside looking in nor should you let other white people define that for you. Uh, this is a chance where you really do get to use your individualism for good reasons. There's a question, are you, you going to answer something else, Mary? No, I was going to, to, to shift, but go ahead. Go ahead. So there's a, there's a question here, uh, one, one really early and one kind of late, but I think they go together. Somebody is asking or recognizing that whiteness and white supremacy is really all around us. So how do we really um, work our way towards um, uh, this, this standard of non-white, I mean, um, uh, work our way towards a non-racist standard of whiteness? And somebody is also asking about how is it that we should be getting um, administrators and, and faculty on campuses to move in the direction of anti-racism? Um, that, that's a bunch of questions. I could give you my facetious answer, which is that uh, white supremacy is actually, this isn't facetious, is white heterosexual male privilege, which I call WIMP. Um, when you threaten white heterosexual male privilege, then something changes. And my proof of that is that there were peaceful demonstrators who were demonstrating and no one was paying much attention to them. They've demonstrated for many of the incidences of violence against men of color and no one pays attention to them. But when they start burning down things in the expensive white neighborhoods, threatening white heterosexual male privilege, people pay attention to them. So a, a facetious answer is burn down the university, but a more serious answer is you do have to make noise. Uh, nothing happens unless you make, make some kind of noise that threatens the institution as it is. And so you change by not assuming that it's impossible to change, but figuring out how you can do it, even though doing it may be a risk to you uh, to, to try that. Um, I was um, watching, well, actually I wasn't watching it, but I sort of looked in to see what's, what's happening at the Trump rally uh, this weekend, I guess. And there was one white woman who was uh, wearing a t-shirt who was, who, that said, I can't breathe. And the police arrested her. She took a risk to change what she thought was wrong with what was happening. And so no matter how small the situation is, I think the watchword is, we don't change the system unless you're willing to take a risk. I um, am also, I think, uh, Dr. Green, but okay with time, if folks are okay with time. There are some, some pointers or tips that um, 
I think Dr. Helms offers in addition to just to continue this part of the conversation that may address some of the questions that I think would be really helpful as we transition towards ending. Um, and I know that I think the session is being recorded, but certainly if folks have time, then I think we can transition to that piece or I think, oh, I'm, I'm okay. Dr. Helms, are you okay with doing that? Uh, I'm, I'm okay. okay. Um, so we're not going to, I think if we <laughs> get to all of the points, ideally there'll be a follow-up conversation where we can touch on some additional things, but we did want to get to this piece about, you know, within the system, from a teaching perspective, from an administrative perspective, um, within the institution, you know, what white identified folks can and need to be doing, um, as well as some recommendations that we have for BIPOC uh, individuals. So we, it might we start, Dr. Helms, with, you know, for example, white faculty, um, and, you know, thinking about where the conversations need to happen and I'm saying faculty because we talked about classroom, but maybe we'll just say white identified individuals in the institution, um, where conversations about race and racism and white racial identity need to happen, what they look like, and any kind of su suggestions that you might have for how to go about engaging. Um, that sounds like a plan. Yeah. Um, I actually think that many white faculty start out with the intention of teaching about racism by talking about the black or the Latinx. They rarely talk about the Asian. They rarely talk about the indigenous. So the black or Latinx experience. But they, those are experiences they do not have. And so they cannot talk about them. And so they recognize that they are imposters. What they don't talk about is whiteness. They don't share with people of color the rules of whiteness. If we knew, for example, what it is about white socialization that allows you to ignore pain and suffering, we could do something about that. So instead of, for instance, asking me how I feel about the uh, George Floyd situation, I would like to know how you feel. What's happening in your environment to cope with the situation? Why, does it, why did it take that kind of an event for you to become aware of your whiteness? And why does it take uh, pain and suffering of people of color in order for you to be in touch with what's happening on a daily basis with respect to institutional, interpersonal, and intrapersonal racism? Mm -hmm. So my, 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 one, my first one would be get in touch with who you are as a white person so you understand the rules by which you operate. Yeah, I think I would overemphasize, um, given the, again, those demographics that you presented us and, and thinking about some of the coursework, you know, in curricula and institutions um, for white professors from a teaching perspective to really attend to and to understand that conversations are around about race are not located right relative to one or two uh, particular racial demographic groups. Um, so I, I think years ago, in one of the courses that I teach, I use this every semester that I teach, <clears throat> my critical perspectives course, um, Psychology of Women, and we look at intersections of race, class, and gender. I ask my students um, who represent a, a wide variety um, of uh, racial uh, groups, I ask them, you know, about their racial socialization experiences. Um, they've not heard about racial identity theory. We learn racial identity theory. Um, they've not really had conversations around whiteness. They hear the term intersectionality and all of those things, but overwhelmingly their conversations and what they know about race, they will tell me, regardless of, um, you know, their racial categorization, that maybe one to two pages in any given history book across their K through 12 education, most often slavery, and maybe something, you know, about indigenous folks, but beyond that, no, com you know, very few conversations at home, et cetera. So it's an opportunity um, to both uh, teach, but also to expand that teaching to include, right, whiteness um, and have students understand that. It has been, I think, for my students, at least from the feedback that I get, um, life-changing um, for some of them who, you know, really begin to have a full grasp and understanding of why and how, you know, race construct what racism means but really how that continues to play out and what they then can do right in an effort to challenge it okay other things for white teachers the other point um, I think that's worth uh, making those for, uh, for folks who are operating you know predominantly from an immersion schema that idea of the need to build a network um, for white identified folks I think is an important one, if you want to build upon that. 
and I, I think the uh, reason you, okay. when, when you began to talk about whiteness in your, in your classes, mm -hmm. actually don't be surprised if you get pushback from people of color because they are not used to white people talking about themselves. And so you will get pushback from them. You will get pushback from other white people because they also are not used to white people talking about whiteness. And so the, you, you will naturally feel, well, I could be in a lot less trouble if I just did what I typically do, which is talk about the people of color. But that doesn't change racism because people of color did not create it and we can't actually end it by ourselves. So what you want to do is to begin to build a network of other white people who are also operating from the immersion schema because you all can act as support for each other. And when you've had a really bad day, you call them up and you say, this happened. And then you can get the kind of support that will encourage you to go on. Um, I think um, that's something that people of color, at least the people of color I know do routinely in academia because we are likely to be very few as you saw in that in that chart and so we support one another think about yourself if you're using the immersion e immersion schema as being at the bottom rung of that chart too because now you have broken the rules and you're pushed out of the power structure yes and I would say for white identified folks being pushed out of the power structure can come in very creative ways um, so you may find yourself, you know, being isolated from, you know, social events, but also um, I've certainly witnessed and seen for um, white identified folks who are operating from the immersion scheme and really advocating and speaking out about racism that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, their productivity is questioned or the activities that they're engaged in is questioned. So I think really being aware of that is important, what that, how that plays out. Um, institutionally are things that people of color um, likely experience in the institution, but that may feel very new and different and confusing, right, for um, white identified folks. Um, I think if, if, unless you have something else to add, I, we also talked about the importance recognizing that um, there may also be uh, faculty, staff, um, and other folks and uh, students of color uh, present, uh, present here today, because for me, I think an important piece of this and having the conversation is, are some of the survival tips um, that we might offer um, to those individuals in the institution, some reminders, I think, in survival. So if I were to list or describe one of those, it is that uh, people of color are socialized to take care of white people in one way or another. Uh, either we, we may protect police officers by putting our hands on the steering wheel. We may protect white women by not letting them feel bad. We may protect white men by always being deferent to them. We are socialized to take care of people. And what that often means then is that we don't take care of ourselves. So we are in an era now when it's really important for people, to, people of color to be able to say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to take care of you in that way. One way you can do that is when people ask you to relive experiences that you perceive as traumatic, you can actually say, no, I don't want to do with that, deal with that in that way. Um, you have the right to own who you are as much as they own who it is that they are. Um, you'll have to say it a lot of times because white power structures, white faculty, white students are not used to people of color saying, no, I don't want to interact with you in that way. What would you say, Dr. Helms, to, and I've just come a few times, to um, people of color that, that are struggling with the idea of saying no, um, but also feeling as though they may have you know, the opportunity, or in some cases, they feel as though they have a seat at the table to change things so that they need to be the person to press forward and to, to speak up because who else will? What would you say to that? I would say that uh, we need to begin to think about not having the responsibility for changing systems. If we are in a space where systems can change, we may speak our truth, say what we think needs to happen, but then it's not our responsibility to make it work. Uh, sometimes what will happen is, at least in my experience, that I'm on a committee and they ask for suggestions and I give them a suggestion and then I'm the person who's supposed to make that suggestion work out. 
what you want to do is you make the suggestion, but you're not going to take on the role of being responsible for making the suggestion work because you're not in control of that system. And so your question it should always be, well, how is the system going to make my uh, recommendation work in this, in this environment, in this context? What um, guidance or advice have you given your um, advisees throughout the years, Dr. Helms, with regard to how to survive um, in academia? You mean you don't know the answer to that question? I do. <laughs> and I guess, <laughs> but I thought I'd give you the first go. I remind you of other things that maybe you've told me over time. Well, what, what, one of the uh, ways that I advise them is that they need to read a race is a nice thing to have too. <laughs> because it's not only for developing white people, but it's also for understanding how white people function. And so if you know that a person is using the reintegration schema, you're not going to have much luck negotiating with that person because whatever it is, they're protecting themselves. And so they're not, they're not who you should choose as your resource. But there are some people uh, like pseudo independent people like to think of themselves as your, as your ally and so you make use of that uh, thought process of theirs. Even if they are not perfect, they will do, do things, they will negotiate systems for you because as long as it fits into their model of affirmative action, then uh, they're more comfortable doing that. So you negotiate, you see who the immersion, immersion people are and form alliances. You see who the pseudo independent people are. You see who the oblivious people are. Oblivi oblivious people don't help you very much, but they don't hurt you too much. Um, and so you have to begin to weigh who's in the environment, what kind of environment you're in. I tell my students, do not commit academic suicide. And so if you're in a totally reintegration environment, you cope in that environment. And then when you leave, you take steps to change that environment. Did I tell you anything else of use in your academic life? Yes, um, I think I would add two things to that. One that's been really um, important and essential for me, it's something you touched upon earlier, which is that um, often, you, you told all of us, I say us being you know, folks that I was uh, the institute with when we were training as graduate research assistants, but that we would likely, uh, that that would be the last time, right, that there was a, a concerted effort for a group of folks who were dedicated to a common mission to be in one space or place, even if that was hard for us to hear. It's been true. And so you encouraged us to remain connected because we would likely be, right, those would be our colleagues and folks that we would need to reach out to and to leverage to both assist us in our survival on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but also to, when we choose to take a step back, one of my strategies is, I'm not going to do that, but I've got a colleague, right, that um, can be paid to potentially come in and do that work as a consultant. Um, so it is uh, about understanding, not, not a superficial network, but really investing and having folks um, let, you know, who, are, who are ready and able to uh, support you truly, to validate you truly, but also to figure out and to strategize about how to take action. Much of the progress or movement or shifts in my academic career you know, between institutions has happened as a result of Black women behind the scenes who get on the phone, make the phone calls, and figure it out um, because they were in position, right? Or, you know, later in their careers or otherwise. So that's that's. I'm not, you know, uh, forgetful of that by any means. It's also something I try to teach my mentees currently, and something that I live. So whether it's the daily macro aggression, and I need to walk to my car and um, call Dr. Green or send him a message so that I can figure out what I need to do in the moment, or you know, at this point, you know, teaming up with uh, some of my colleagues in an effort to continue the fight you know, against racism uh, in other institutions. The other thing that you told me when I was really disheartened, um, I thought about sharing with or not, was sometimes it can feel like a battlefield um, and very isolating. Um, and so I think for people of, of color in particular, and I, I, my emotion are more about, because I'm going right back to that moment, I was really upset and you told me, you've got to figure out what your armor is. Like you on that battlefield, it can feel like there's just something chipping away at your armor. And so Miriam, you have got to take a step back and figure out what that is for you. And I tell all my mentees this, so that you can go do it and you know, brush out and rub out and push out all of the, um, the chips and the dents, et cetera, that you know, are, um, 
are in your armor. So what's your armor, right? Fix it and come back because there's more work to be done if you're truly committed to this work. And you always, you know, have challenged and just sort of said like, what are you willing, you know, to do for this? And that's always at the forefront in terms of anything that I do. But that, that, and I don't mean this um, in any light way, really saved my life in addition to it. Because it was like, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I, this, uh, and it was like, okay, well, let me figure this out. And at that time, it was to go immerse myself in blackness. Um, which is what I did. And then I was able to come back, right, and continue the work. For everyone, your armor is going to be different, but it's necessary because um, racism is not new um, and it's not going to change tomorrow, even if there are folks that are on their way to being, you know, awakening. Um, and so it's still, you know, a long road ahead. And it's necessary that we have everybody at the table intact. And recognize the difference between family and warriors on the battlefield. Yeah. So are y'all coming to an end or? <laughs> I think we'll just drop that there. <laughs> um, and uh, if there are any, you know, remaining questions or anything, you know, Dr. Green, you know, to, to close us out, we thank everyone for listening to us, or I would say more so Dr. Helms, I enjoyed listening to her talk and always reminds me of so many things. I'm happy to just be a part to, to help navigate you know, that piece of the conversation um, so that we can all share from her wisdom. Well, so, I, I always benefit from Dr. Jernigan's wisdom too. So uh, it's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> I sort of like to Dr. Green sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want <clears throat> to close by, uh, well, begin to bring us to a close because I do want to hear a few things from um, both of you. Um, uh, Dr. Jernigan, do you want to talk to folks a little bit about where they can find you um, with regards to um, your, your consultation services and or your social media um, platform? Sure, I would say the most active, Dr. Um, Green uh, read a little bit about my background these days. I've been pretty passionate doing lots of racial trauma related work as well as organizational consulting. A big piece for me has always been K through 12 as well as uh, institutions of higher education um, and looking at race and racism. So um, right now really active or at least trying to be active on my Instagram page, which is mindfield underscore Dr. J. So that's M-I-N-D-F-I-E-L-D mindfield, as you see the connection to the battlefield there in terms of, you know, minefield, but with a D, underscore Dr. J, um, or my, my website, which is Jernigan and Associates Consulting LLC, um, would probably be the easiest um, way to reach me. Did you have another part of that question? Is that it? Uh, no, th those are the two pieces, okay. right. Um, Dr. Hemp, yeah. and, and to be able to just really emphasize that a part of the thing that I think that I've learned from both of these women is to um, we really try and make sure that we use the, the training that we have to make it applicable um, for people so that they can figure out how to progress along in their identity development and stop harming Black people in settings. Mm -hmm. Dr. Helms, do you want to talk a little bit about the diversity challenge and where people might be able to find, well, where people can find you as well as the diversity challenge? Yes, I was afraid you weren't going to let me do my advertising. <laughs> uh, my uh, email address where you can find lots of fascinating things is isprc at b is in boston c college dot edu um, there you will find find information about diversity challenge which is our international conference that's happened every year this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary i think that i was the first uh, institute to make race an explicit focus of what it was that the Institute does and to maintain that focus even in the era of diversity. So this year, unfortunately, for our 20th anniversary, it has to be virtual, but I'm sure it will be an exciting virtual conference. And so I invite you all to attend. It's October 23rd and 24th of uh, this year. I will also say that even though Amazon is sold out of books, the publisher Cognella says that they can publish on demand. So just email them and they will be happy to send, send you all the books you want, like a hundred or so. I was going to say, Dr. Green, also um, through the ISPRC webpage, 
um, after, uh, was it last week, we all came together. We will be doing more live free programming for the public. Um, I will do a part two um, of more of an interview than a conversation with Dr. Helms, um, I believe next week. So just look out um, for any announcements related to that, because as you said, a large part of our work, you know, we like to um, send directly to the community and by demand and upon request, I think we will continue some conversations um, uh, with regard to the work that we're all doing, including um, Dr. Helms will jump us off with, you know, continued conversation from today. So were you going to say anything else, Dr. Helms? Um, no, I, well, I, I, will, I will say this to maybe raise anticipation. Um, I think I saw a question floating around about the GRE. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'm going to publish something that shows that that whole process is rigged. But if I don't get it published in a journal, it'll be on my webpage. <laughs> so I just want to close by, by thanking both of you for being here. Um, I am tremendously grateful, having been asked by Paris and Della to participate in the programming for Academics for Black Lives as we were um, beginning to think more about, um, uh, well, as Paris and Della refer to it, dream building. Um, the idea of having Dr. Helms participate in this day to really talk a little more, to talk more about whiteness in academia um, just became sort of like, how could we not do that? So. Um, reached out to her and then I already knew that Dr. Jernigan was planning a conversation with Dr. Helms, so I invited both of them to come and do part one of this conversation. So stay tuned if you would like to hear more next week. Is it next week, Marion? Wednesday, um, July 1st. Wednesday, July 1st on the ISPRC Facebook page is where you will find that. And so you look for um, information to go out advertising that. I think that on day one, one of the things that I said for the um, Academics for Black Survival and Wellness training was, if we let them, Black women will lead us to liberation. It's something that I have really come to understand and value, um, especially from these particular two Black women, as well as the others who launched me into education years ago. I'm just really grateful for um, the, the spirit and the energy and the wisdom um, and the courage of these Black women to sit and have this conversation and also to the other Black women who've been supporting um, and guiding this program. So thank you all so much for everything that you do. Um, I am particularly grateful. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.